Welcome everyone to a special edition of Moonscapes. Today is July the 2nd, 2013. The moon is uh, headed towards last quarter and eventually new. Uh, so it's ended this cycle and I won't be getting out the image it again for a little bit. Uh, and I was thinking it would be nice if I could uh, set up and, and well show, show you just what goes into the making of a moonscape session. Um, uh, it's uh, maybe a little more, a little bit more elaborate than you might actually think. Um, and before I start showing you all this nifty little equipment that I have here, uh, and you're thinking about imaging the moon yourself sometimes, uh, don't let this uh, scare you off, so to say. Um, I mean, if you have a telescope that gives you a d decent image of the moon, um, uh, it doesn't have to be the best scope in the world, then go out and grab one of these C9, uh, uh, C910 uh, uh, Logitech web webcams and uh, give it a shot. Um, uh, you can, uh, even if your scope don't cr track, you can put it on the moon, uh, focus up as best you can, put the moon on the edge of the field, and then just watch it uh, drift through your field and on out. And I'll tell you, when you get your first lunar image, it's a real rush. Uh, it, it's something you won't forget. When you create your fro first image of the moon yourself, and you can see craters and mountains on the moon, it, it, it's really, it, it's really something. Um, so... Let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the equipment uh, we use uh, for doing one of my Moonscape sessions. Uh, before you is uh, my big gun, as I call it. This is the 10-inch. Uh, it's the Mead uh, LXD55 10-inch uh, F4. Uh, and as I said before, I needed to reach over and grab something. Sorry about that. Uh, F4 means that it's a very short focal length. It's uh, the 4 inches of the F4 times the 10 inch diameter. It gives you 40 inches. Um, the uh, light comes in through the top here, naturally. And, and that black tube up here, that's just a dew shield to keep dew from forming on um, the uh, lens here. The, uh, there's a, a, a plate glass, not, not plate glass, but a, a glass lens in front. Um, this type of telescope is actually called a Schmidt Newtonian telescope because of that uh, glass collecting lens up in front. It is right here in the front of the telescope. Um, it passes the light through and actually helps sharpen up the light. It goes, the light goes down and hits the 10 inch primary mirror, which is down here at the bottom. Uh, once it hits that mirror, that concave mirror sends the light back up to the secondary mirror up here, which is at a 45 degree angle, which sends the light out through the eyepiece and of course our Logitech C910 camera. Uh, so that's how we um, uh, get the light to our camera with this telescope. Now I said it's F4, that's only a 40 inch focal length. Uh, it, this telescope is, is more for deep sky faint fuzzy objects uh, when I used to do CCD imaging. Uh, so to get the longer focal lengths like F8 or for an 80 inch focal length, uh, we would need a 2x Barlow. Um, a 3x Barlow would give us 3 times 40 or 120 inches of focal length and so on. Uh, so to get the longer focal length with, with this telescope, we're going to have to use Barlow lenses. Um, and I did just that when I used this instrument for, I believe, I can't remember the the moonscape numbers, but they were the ones I did when we were looking at the crater Rixus, uh, which uh, Bill Bryson down in Richmond, Texas, uh, in his moon musing site, uh, claims to have uh, discovered what he calls a snake bridge. Well, we went looking for it, and I did two sessions that night with this telescope uh, with two different eyepieces. Um, see if there's anything more uh, on that uh tube assembly which might be interesting before we move on to um, uh, the mount. Um, now I, th I think that's about it for now. Now just give me a minute and let me see if I can rearrange uh, my, uh, my camera and we'll see if we can take a look at the mount. Let's see. You have to forgive me, I'm just laying these uh, webcams on, on the desk here and I'm just uh, 
using some paper towels to kind of hold them in place. But the uh, camera I'm actually using now is my uh, C535, uh, uh, see, I think, no, 525 or 535 Logitech camera. It was the first one I, I bought when I did a couple sessions uh, and before I... Uh, uh, you know, bought the C9110, uh, the C910 camera uh, by Logitech, uh, which is the fine camera that we're using now. Um, okay, uh, the first thing we notice on this mount is notice, and I'm trying to sit by the mic and so I don't have to move it and getting a long pointer that I put together. Right here, all this weight right here, that is dead counterweight. All that weight right there is counterweight. It's about 40 pounds. And we need that 40 pounds because we have to balance all the weight of the telescope up here above it. Um, this telescope up here weighs in the vicinity of uh, 35 to 40 pounds itself. So we need all that uh, counterweighting uh, weight to offset the weight of the telescope. If we did not have that, the telescope would not function. Um, the weight would just be, the difference would be just too much. And by the way, that also means that the tube assembly up here on top, uh, that also has to be balanced. And if I can do this without too much camera jiggle, um, this end of the tube has to be equal in weight to the end of the tube back here. Uh, so when you lay that telescope out on its side and let go without the clutches connected, uh, the telescope should just lay straight across, just like it looks right there. Uh, so it's perfectly balanced. That way when the, the motors are driving the telescope, uh, they're not stressed and pushed to the limit. Uh, and the telescope will drive much, much better. Um, I think maybe what I'm going to do uh, is go... Go to my uh, other instruments that I use, and then we'll go back to the mount, and I'll show you a setup session uh, with that 10-inch and a setup session with the mount because that mount is used for uh, all the instruments that I use for this project and the instruments you're about to see. So we're going to move. Just uh, don't mind my webcam jiggle here for a second, and I'm going to see if I can do this. Uh, let me see if I can do it by... Setting the camera down, and let's uh, let's see if we can get this to balance on this spot or not. I don't know whether this is going to be successful or not. Um, it's a little bit tough. I may have to hold it by hand. I really don't want to do that, but uh, that's that's promising. Um, all right, let's let's start with uh, the longer longer telescope there, the uh, long telescope tube here, this one, let me see, can you see the pointer? Not very well, but anyway, this, this telescope tube here is the, uh, the Orion 4.7 inch. Um, that has a focal length of 1,000 millimeters, uh, and believe it or not, that is the shortest focal length of all the telescopes I have. It's slightly shorter than the 40 inch focal length of the 8 inch, and believe it or not, it's a lot shorter than that little stub, tub, uh, stubby telescope that we're going to talk about next. But uh, that telescope has worked out very nicely. Um, I used it the night of the super full moon. Um, I believe it's the last video that I actually put up. Uh, and so if you go back and check out that video, that was done with this uh, 4.7 inch Orion uh, refractor. Um, and since it's a relatively low power, by using a 21 millimeter eyepiece, I was able to get the whole moon's disk in uh, to do that video, and then of course zoom in on uh, uh, some, some sites of interest during full moon. Uh, but that's a nice little telescope to use. That's the one that I bought the V-block filter for. Um, and uh, it, it, it does give some nice images of the moon, and I think gives some, uh, you know, some uh, true color images by using that V-block filter. Um, this little guy in the back is, let me see if I can get this camera to uh, pick that up a little better. Uh, I might have to play some games with that. Let me see here. Uh, there we go. There. Okay. Uh, the angle may be a little weird because I had to, just the way I got the camera laid down. But this instrument right here, this 
the one here, is a Maksudov Cassegrain telescope. It's a 5-inch uh, F12, so that's 60 inches of focal length. It's the longest focal length telescope I have, and you might say after looking at the monster 10-inch and the long 4.7-inch refractor, and you look at that little stubby tube, you can say, well, how can that be? Well, it's because it's the design of that telescope. It's what's called a Maksudov Cassegrain telescope. Um, up in front, see very, right up here at the very front of the telescope, uh, there's that black cap. That's just a dust cap. And right behind that cap is uh, a 5-inch meniscus lens, very sharply curved lens um, of uh, high, high quality shots glass glass uh, made by Skywatcher. Um, that collects the first amount of light coming into the telescope and it actually starts the magnification process. That then sends the light down to a five inch mirror which is located right here at the base of the telescope. There's a five inch concave mirror there that collects that light from the meniscus lens. It's already been slightly uh, magnified. Uh, that sends the uh, light back up to a secondary up here in the front of the telescope. And I didn't show you that on the big 10 inch. Um, it's kind of a pain to try to do that. I may, I may or may not do that further down the road. But anyway, the light hits that uh, secondary in there and then uh, it, it goes off that secondary which is also curved. And it's also curved in a way that it also magnifies the light some more as it sends it back down the tube, out this eyepiece end here, into the eyepiece and then the camera. Uh, and that magnifies uh, that uh, the light uh, of whatever you're looking at uh, again after coming off that secondary mirror. And it gives you a total F value of F12 or 60 inches of focal length. Um, and because of the uh, design of that telescope, um, it gives extremely, extremely sharp images. Uh, some of the uh, moonscape sessions that I've done uh, were done strictly with this, this telescope. One, the one most recently, um, I don't recall the number, but it was on the Marius Hills and the Aristarchus region. Um, and it was done with a new eyepiece that I have, a Mead 9mm, and the quality of that image, I, th I think, were some of the best that I've done. Um, they were crisp, clean images. Um, the telescope just responds very, very well, and with that new eyepiece, it, it really uh, it really does a nice job. Um, before I go on and, and go on to the mount, I may, depending on how well I can reset this camera back up, Let's see, get this camera back in place, okay, that's not looking too bad, okay, I may try to tilt this telescope and show you the uh, secondary because that does cause an obstruction which I'd like to talk about, so just give me a second while I leave the mic and turn that telescope towards the camera. how well you can see that. I have a flashlight here. Let's see if that's going to help any. Uh, that does somewhat. Let me uh, get my pointer here. Right in here, uh, right in the center, you can see that spot there. It's got the uh, mead emblem on it. That is the secondary holder for this uh, Schmidt Newtonian telescope. As I say, the light will go down through that uh, corrector plate lens there to the main mirror and then come back up to that secondary and then out the eyepiece and camera. Now, one of the things I said early on when I started this study of the moon in color is that I thought that secondary lens at times 
was causing uh, trouble with aberration and causing false color, and I still think that's um, an issue. Um, you can get around it uh, by being very, very careful about how you mount your camera in position to take the images. Um, so it, it's not a, a you know a death knell for the for the camera, so you, you can't trust it. It's just how you have to be careful of it. It can give some false color if you're not careful. Uh, with that secondary obstruction, because what it does, it's you're taking an object like the moon, which is very bright, and so it's the the brightness of the moon is actually throwing a, a shadow back on the mirror uh, from that round uh, dark spot in the center, uh, and so it, on a bright object, it can cause some slight problems w uh, with color aberration. When you're dealing with stars and nebula, there's no issue whatsoever, so it's not an issue with something like that. Okay, I'm going to go back and put the telescope back in its home position, and then we'll talk about the mount. Okay, now we're going to talk about the mount of this telescope, and we're going to do, I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do this because uh, my voice is not going to carry very well, um, and I may have to see, let me see how far this uh, uh, hand control will stretch over, and in fact I forgot to hook it up, I've got to do that right now. Okay, well, let's let me get up fairly close to the uh, mic here, so that's, all right, let's hope everything is okay. Uh, we turn on and initialize the mount, and it gives us the welcome screen, and we hit enter. And it says, do I want to begin alignment? And I say yes. Uh, location, uh, I've already entered in the location of latitude and longitude here on Earth, um, so we know where we are. The telescope, or the telescope knows where it is, I should say. And then our time zone, of course, is Eastern Standard Time, which is minus five hours uh, um, Greenwich Mean. Uh, and then the date. Um, and I have already said in here uh, the date of 7-20-213, or July 20th. Make you believe we're going to be going out on it. It's the night of July the 20th, 2013. Next thing it says is the time. And uh, it's given me... Uh, eight o'clock. So let's just go. Uh, let's let's go and say it's eight thirty. Uh, I'll enter in twenty hours. That's no arbitrary time. And then eight thirty. So that's and hit enter. And it says okay, eight thirty. It's telling me so the time is correct. And then it says daylight saving time. Yes or no? Yes, we're in daylight saving time. And I hit yes. Um, it's too bad you can't really even see what I'm doing here. I probably should have come over here and actually go in front of the screen, but this is the hand control. Um, and then it says alignment, three star. Uh, now, back when I was doing CCD imaging, um, uh, three star alignment meant that you used three stars, and the, and the uh, uh, mount was then very, very accurately aligned. Um, and that way you could do anything. You, you could go find deep sky objects and it would um, it'd be very accurate in picking those up. Being that we're working with the moon, we can get away with just using a one-star alignment because the moon is so bright we don't have to really worry about looking uh, you know, for any uh, uh, faint deep sky object. But uh, let me just explain one thing to you. When you set this telescope up, this axis right here, the, from back here, up through the front right here is called the polar axis or the right ascension axis. That needs to be pointed or that axis needs to be parallel with the axis of the earth. And we can do that simply by aligning it uh, at where the north star is in the sky. The north star is actually 40 arc minutes off the true north. Uh, so that's close enough or we can calculate where the north 
uh, pole is actually off the North Star and make it a little more um, accurate. But for the moon, it's not all that important. So we're going to go with a one star alignment, and I hit one, and, it says, and then I hit enter. Uh, and it's searching for stars for me to pick that night uh, that might be useful in uh, uh, using to uh, set the telescope. So I'm going to pick Arcturus. And now with the telescope, and I hit enter, and now you see the telescope is moving. It's going to the star Arcturus. I'll lift that up. You might be able to see a little better. You can see the telescope is moving. It's heading to where the star Arcturus should be. And there it has found it. Uh, I'm going to lay this down. Um, okay, when it stops moving, it's slowing stops, okay. Now it, it's at a position in the sky where it thinks Arcturus should be. But we've just dropped this telescope down and given it a rough alignment. So now what we need to do is you go over and you look in the finder, and by using the press, press buttons on this control, you center up um, Arcturus right on the crosshair of the finder and then make sure it's in the eyepiece of the telescope, and then hit enter. And the computer to the telescope says, alignment successful, and we're done. We're ready to go to the moon and start our night's work. So I back out of here, and I hit planet, and the first one comes up is Mercury. They're in alphabetical order. The next one's going to say moon, which it does. I hit enter. It gives me the position of the moon. Ask me if I want to observe it. Of course I do. And now the telescope is going to go. You can see it moving in the background to the moon. And we'll let it finish its movement. And now it's homing in on the position where the moon would be in the night sky. Okay, it's slowing down and stopping. And when I hear a beep, still slowing down. And there's the beep, and the moon is now in our telescope. And give me a second to replace this hand control. And now we would begin our lunar observations. Uh, let me get the camera set up a little bit here. A little better so we can see what's going on. So that's that's how we get the alignment on the on the moon. The telescope is now aligned on the moon and we start our work. Now, up on top you can see that is actually the uh, C9110 camera they use for imaging the moon. Um, I think I'm going to tell the telescope to go back to its home position to finish up describing how we do the rest of the imaging and then I'll, and along with that, I'm going to show you the rest of the equipment that I bring out with me every night to set up to show you just uh, um, how complex this can actually be. So give me a second now to put the telescope back in home position. Actually, what the telescope is doing now, this is what I would do at the end of the night. I tell it to go to home posi park position. And the telescope is going back to the position it was in when I set it up to start out the night. And this is uh, where I would take it to to break it down, um, to pack it up and bring it in for the night. Uh, something I want to tell you about this instrument. I mentioned it the night I was out imaging with it. Um, 
and uh, I'll try to pan down a little bit so you can see it. This whole instrument, which includes those tripod legs that mount in the center with all those counterweights and the tube assembly up here on top. All that weighs in the vicinity of 100 pounds. Um, so it's quite an adventure to set this big instrument up. Uh, my little Mac Sudoff uh, Cassegrain weighs 9 pounds. So if I use that telescope, and I do use that telescope on this very mount, I can get rid of 30 pounds of that dead weight counterweight because the, the, the Max Sudoff cast grain only weighs 9 pounds. Um, so, now, I'm going to go ahead and show you all the other items that I bring out with me uh, on a night of imaging uh, to show you how involved it is. And then I'll talk a little bit about taking the actual image uh, with this telescope. There's one neat little trick which I found which improves the quality of the images and how well these eyepieces function a great deal. And it's a very simple thing and it took me a little while to figure it out myself um, and, and we'll take a look at that too. But what, let, let's start and move around here and look at just some of the other things that have to go outside with me when I'm going to do one of these sessions. Okay. Uh, see. First of all, there, of course, behind uh, my Max Sudoff Cassidy, you can see that black power pack with the green light on it. Um, that's a uh, Celesteron power tank. Uh, it's a 12-volt power supply. That'll run this telescope all night long. If I ran an all-night session till dawn, there would be enough power in that to uh, power it for the full night. Uh, at the end of the night, uh, you, you pack it up, bring it in, plug it into a wall outlet, uh, and in about 12 to 18 hours, it's ready to go again for another full night's use. So that has to come out with me. Now we're going to slide over, and we have a, a red-looking floor because it's a little bit dark over here. Uh, we have two other power tanks. The gray one on the right is the more powerful of the tanks I have. That one I use to power the um, computer that we are using to run the Logitech camera. It runs the camera, the software, um, and uh, the microphone that I'm using. Uh, and uh, it, it'll run my computer. I, I've run it for over four hours, and it's still been up in the green. Uh, so we've had plenty of, plenty of time uh, for computer time on that power tank. Now, off to its left, you notice that uh, black and red little power unit? That's a smaller unit, and I use that uh, on the second computer that I have outside. Uh, that's the second computer that runs uh, the Lunar Atlas Virtual Moon Atlas program. Uh, I can get that to push that computer roughly two hours, and then the computer will go on its own battery. Uh, so I could probably get three, three and a half hours of battery time altogether, uh, more than enough to do a lunar session outside. So those two have to go out with me. Down here is a clear bag of coils of wires. All those wires are needed because all this equipment is set up about oh, at least six, maybe eight feet away from my car, the back window of my car. Um, the power supply or uh, the hand controller for the telescope gets an extension cord put on that. Uh, that is in that bag. That comes into the car with me. Uh, that way I can control the, the telescope and go anywhere. As you see during these videos, I can go anywhere I want uh, on the moon by using the hand controller uh, 15 feet away from the telescope. Um, and then there is a, a long USB extension cord which hooks on to, up on top there, is uh, the uh, camera. And there you can see the USB wound up cord hanging there. Um, it gets an ex extension cord plugged into that. Um, that comes in the back window of the car and gets plugged into the computer. Um, and uh, so every, I run everything basically remotely. Um, I sit in the car because it's more comfortable. Uh, when it's cold out, I can use the heater. When there's bugs around, I can uh, do away with the bugs. Uh, 
can use the heater on the car if I want, and if it in the cold, and if it's a really warm, steamy night, I could even use the air conditioner if I wanted to. Um, so we have that that comes out with us. So all of, all that equipment needs to come. And next, we'll come around, and here we are now looking at uh, the computer, the main computer. As you can see, this is running the uh, software for the camera. Um, you can see the controls off there on the right hand side. Uh, I don't know uh, if you can see, I don't know what that, uh, I'm not sure what that, oh, that's just a, a reflection in there. But you can see on the Logitech software, see how small the, re, the, the preview screen is? It's up in the, uh, it's up in the upper uh, left hand corner of the computer. It's uh, uh, really pretty tiny. Uh, and sometimes it makes uh, doing the videos quite hard. Uh, and anyway, so we have that computer, uh, and that runs off of, of course, that uh, power pack. And then uh, this computer is my Lunar Atlas computer. And what's nice about this is I can pick any crater, hit on it. It'll tell me, okay, it is the crater Ptolemaeus. And as soon as I can find it, yes. And then uh, there's information on there that I can give you. Um, it's like, um, let's see, it's, oh, wait a minute, I've got the wrong crater. I've got one of the little tiny craters that's in Ptolemaeus. Uh, Ptolemaeus itself is 158 kilometers uh, wide, and that is 93 miles. Now, notice what's nice about this is I can change it. This is set for the night that, uh, make believe night that we're out observing. Let's say I want to go out two nights from this night. I set that date into the computer, hit compute, and we will get, I'll try to get this on the screen so you can see it happen. There you go. And it shows a terminator for that night, two, uh, two nights from now. So that's a nice little feature to have. And then here are just some of the eyepieces. Um, I have a set of Orion uh, Strata 68 eyepieces. As you can see, a uh, nice field lens in them, good size hefty eyepiece. Uh, this is the 13 millimeter, I've used this many times, um, and it gives nice wide fields and it gives a lot of zoom if you set the camera upright, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, in that Orion series, I have a 21 millimeter, which is actually on the telescope now, and also a 5 millimeter for real high power, which I have yet to use. Now this little guy here, which looks a little funky because I've got some um, green felt put on it, is that brand new uh, Mead 9 millimeter 60 degree EDI piece. And the reason I put the green felt on is if you compare it to the Orion eyepiece, you can see I brought it up to size and diameter with the Orion eyepiece. That's so those uh, screws that hold the camera in place will match up pretty well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to turn the screws way, way in to uh, match that 9 millimeter. So it's just for ease that I put that on there, changing out between the two eyepieces. That 9 millimeter eyepiece worked excellent. And I can't wait to try it with um, a, uh, a Barlow in the future. Uh, I kind of had this stuff in front of the mic. I hope I didn't block my voice too much there for a little while. Um, and then we have, of course, our Barlows. This is a 3X Barlow, 2X Barlow. And I have in my cases over here, there is uh, the main case that has all kinds of goodies strewn all over the place. And there are diagonals um, and my 2-inch, uh, uh, 2X Barlow. And farther up there in the back is uh, a smaller case. That case is the case that holds all the electronics uh, for the Atlas mount, which you just saw go through its paces and drive the telescope. So that kind of, in a nutshell, is what comes out with me at night when I do a session. And it takes some time to set this all up and some effort as I'm going to try to get back and get this set up on the telescope because there's one thing I want to demonstrate now. 
Uh, and that's the final piece of the puzzle. I'm trying to get this set back up where it'll, it shows the... Uh... Okay, I guess that'll work. What I'm going to show you next, and I'm going to have to walk away from the mic to do it, so I'm going to explain what I'm doing and, uh, before I leave the mic, and then I'll just uh, go out and demonstrate it at the telescope. One of the biggest problems uh, with taking these images is getting that camera set on top of the eyepiece correctly. If you go down too far, um, the first thing you do when you slide the eyepiece on, you'll see a, a bright white light. That's the light cone. You slide the camera down, and you think when you hit the eyepiece, you're all set. You should be good. And I found that to be a, a little bit of a problem because it's not the case. What you have to do is move that camera around a little bit, and also back it off a half an inch, a quarter of an inch, three-eighths of an inch, just little tiny bits back and forth until you get the sweetest looking image you can get with the camera uh, zoomed at about two or three clicks of zoom in. Uh, when you get the best looking image, then you tighten the screws a little bit so the camera stays put but yet not so tight that you can't nudge it around a little bit. You can still slightly tweak the camera uh, and get the best possible image. And once you do that, you gently let go of the camera and you're off and running. You've got a great uh, color-free image uh, with true color um, and uh, you've got great zoom, the most zoom you possibly can get out of that eyepiece you have. And I'll show you what I mean by moving the camera around here. I'll demonstrate it away from the mic, so I'll have to step away from the mic a second. Don't know if you can hear me, but the camera just gets moved back and forth like this till you get the best image on your computer. Slide it in, and then back it out in and out very, very slowly. Back it out. In and out. And you do that until the, you get the best possible image visible on the screen. Once you do that, you're off and running for the night. Uh, you do your imaging. Uh, you learn how to use the controls of the camera. They're self-explanatory like any webcam software. And you're off and running and having a great time. So, in essence, that is it. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a bit of equipment here to be set up. Um, and I'm up on the second floor of the place we live in. So I have to use the carts that I have around and load it up, take it down to the car, pull the car around and back. Uh, I have a special place where I park where I get a great view of the southern sky and the ecliptic where the moon uh, tracks across the ecliptic uh, throughout the months, any month of the year, and I can get at it. Um, and I can park the car right there and set that mount up and run my wires into the car and we're good to go. Uh, so guys, uh, that's it. It's getting really late. I see I'm pushing 38 minutes. As usual, I just babble on way too much. Um, there's my 10 inch. Hopefully that'll be the next scope I use uh, in the next cycle. Probably be about mid-July with the next video for you guys. Looking forward to it. It's really a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, hooked on it and uh, I'll keep doing it as long as I can so with that guys uh, good health clear skies and hope to see you real quick with a new video take care guys